Hey there, 9 to Fivers. Rich here, looking to kickstart your world domination with a shot of Civ 5 tips. Doesn't matter if the game came out over three years ago, they are still releasing expansions and there's always one more turn to be had. If you've yet to play the game, no worries. This is the 9 to 5 Top 10 Tips for new and casual Civ 5 gamers. Starting us off at number 10 is buy the expansions. When you buy the game, make sure to get all the expansion packs, including Gods and Kings and Brave New World. Look for a gold edition, a humble bundle deal, a steam sale. Uh, you get the idea. One of the benefits of coming to the table late is being able to get everything at a good price, and you do want everything. Each expansion pack provides a real improvement to the base game, and with the rest of the tips, I'll assume that you have each of the expansion packs. Next up is number 9, which is win via domination or score. The Civ series offers you many ways to win the game, and you can find these under advanced setup on the right hand side when you start a new game. Here you may turn them on or off at will, however I would suggest you leave them on for the true Civ experience. Do note though, as an apprentice, as the tip says, that you likely will come to victory through domination or score. Score comes into play at 2050 AD when the game just kind of ends and the player with the highest score is the winner. I would recommend going for bloodshed. Number 8. Set the game speed to quick. The game speed will determine how long it takes to build units and build buildings as well as research technology. You're going to learn a lot in your first few games, and it's better for you to see as much as possible before you get steamrolled by that warmongering Gandhi. As units have the same movement, regardless of game speed, playing on quick often obsoletes a military unit before it reaches its intended target. This will help you be better prepared to defend against surprise attacks from the crafty AI and seasoned players. It's not game breaking, but it does give defense a slight advantage. So keep this in mind if instead you choose to go on the offensive. Your knights may run up against machine guns after a world spanning march. Lucky number seven, pick the map type. Control your future. Don't play a random map for your first game. Knowing the map will be important in choosing which text to invest in and which text not to invest in. If it's not an island or a continent map, Odds are that body of water is a lake and you will be vastly disappointed after spending a century to build a massive and useless navy. Eventually you will need to research nearly every tech, but knowing the map type will help you prioritize. Next up is number 6, which is respect the city states. On your advanced setup you can control the number of city states. I would recommend leaving it at the default. City states are new to Civ 5 and are both awesome and terrible at the same time. They take up precious territory that you could use to expand your empire, and then on the other hand, if you befriend or even woo them into being your ally, they will gift you resources and provide you with a unique benefit based on their type. As an additional benefit to playing nice with city-states, you will receive bonus votes in the World Congress later in the game. If diplomatic victory fits your playstyle, you will need to befriend as many city-states as possible if you ever have a hope of becoming the glorious ruler of the world through diplomatic means. Number 5. Play to your Civ strengths. This is incredibly important. Whether you have a favorite Civ or choose random, take note of your special unit as they usually indicate at what point in the game you should have a military advantage. Always build your special building if you have one and position yourself to use your special bonuses as often as you can. In single player you can easily see the bonuses while you are setting up the game. In multiplayer it might not be as easy but you can always check the Civilpedia to see what bonuses your civilization has. Number 4. Turn on terrain and resource icons. You turn on the yield and resource icons by clicking in the lower right and surprisingly enough turning them on. Knowing what each tile produces is incredibly important in planning your empire. Features like rivers, deserts, mountains, and oceans drastically influence the production of a tile as well as allow you to build unique buildings. What's also important is special resources. They come in luxury, strategic, and what I will call other. Luxuries are like dyes, silks, and spices, and they'll give you happiness. The others are strategic, which are like horses, coal, and oil, and they'll allow you to build better military units and sometimes better production buildings. Then you have the other, which are like deer, stone, and wheat, which result in better tiles, but not necessarily better military or any happiness. Remember that the more the merrier, so make sure you have as many of these as possible when you settle down a new city or on your starting city. Numero tre, that's three. Happiness is incredibly important. An unhappy empire will fall behind. Research will freeze up, your empire will stagnate, your military will question why they even fight, and you will never see a golden age. Ever. Make sure that your happiness stays positive. You do this by developing luxury tiles in your empire, trading for excess luxuries from other nations, constructing buildings that provide happiness, adopting cultural policies that give happiness, or through religious routes. 
There are many ways to gain happiness. Look for the smiley icons and collect as many as you can. Number two, quality will beat quantity. Keep this mantra in mind as you expand your empire. Each additional city you control will increase the cost of new cultural policies and generate empire-wide unhappiness. However, you want additional cities for the population, which in turn gives you more science and more hammers to produce more units. The key here is balance. Map size is crucial, but a good rule of thumb is to limit yourself to about four cities max. And if you conquer more, be they city states or enemies, you just keep them as puppets when they'll continue to produce for you, but they won't impact your cultural policies and they will generate much less unhappiness for you. And now, number one, the old reliable start strategy. This is my personal start strategy and I use it almost every time, especially when I'm feeling indecisive or in a rut. The first thing you want to do after settling with your settler is build a scout and explore with their warrior. You want to find as many ancient runes as possible as these contain awesome goodies that can really help your civilization take off. Your first cultural policy you'll want to take is honor. It'll help you defend against the barbarians as well as give you an early cultural boost. Once your scout has finished being built, you will want to build a monument as this will again help your culture start rolling which will help you unlock further cultural policies and help you grow your empire up or out depending on which way you want to go. Once that is finished, you will want to build a settler. Settlers are like early game spinach. They stop your city from growing because all food and hammers go towards building the settler. But getting a second city started early is a great strategic move and will keep you moving on the right curve to win town. And with that, there you go, 9 to Fivers. That should get you off to a solid start. Subscribe or like if you found these useful. And look for more tips and check out the Let's Play if you learn by watching or want some smooth, soothing warmongering. This is Rich, clocking out. See you later.